Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala amma ba'd. This is your brother Asif Hirani from Worcester Islamic Center in Massachusetts. And alhamdulillah, today we are doing a unique program. It's a Friday night halaqa, but it's a unique program where two of our students uh, from fiqh course, which we are conducting in Worcester Islamic Center, they submitted their research paper. I will tell you more about them. And they will be going to give, pre they will be presenting their research paper for next few minutes, inshallah, and then they will be defending uh, with the invigilator we have, with the supervisor we have, Dr. Basuni Nahila, and then he will be going to give comments on that, inshallah. Uh, just before we can start, I will just tell you, um, uh, we started this course as a Worcester in Worcester Islamic Center, Massachusetts, um, a two-year FIC program, and our primary intention was actually to create local leaders. Uh, we, uh, many times I have my own students from the community where I was imam before the ma in Massachusetts. Before I was imam in Massachusetts, I was imam in New Jersey and in Connecticut. And a few of my students uh, went to different places like in Dallas, in, in Al Qalam and so on and so forth. And um, I realized actually that, that I need to come up with the course which can uh, remove or compensate the intellectual uh, academic terse of the community so that locally our community without uh, having that fatigue of traveling to different states, we can teach them um, uh, and we can create local leaders, inshallah. Uh, so not only we have intellectuals in the community, but even our next generation, inshallah, uh, we're going to um, have leaders within the Muslim community, inshallah. With that, uh, we started this course, alhamdulillah. And both these students who submitted the research paper, they completed two semesters, semesters, one complete year. And part of their completion, again, part of their completion of first year uh, is that they have to submit an academic research and a group project. And two of these students submitted their research on the topic, pulling the plug. That is when to remove ventilator, a patient from ventilator, when to remove life support. And they provided religious argument and both of them um, have the background from the medical knowledge also I will introduce both of them but first let me introduce the supervisor uh, external supervisor Dr. Basuni Nahila let me introduce him and before I can introduce him mashallah he, he's our mentor subhanallah and we are so blessed that alhamdulillah he is with us in New England community uh, Dr. Basuni Nahila holds an MA in fundamentals of religion and a PhD with honors in Dawa and Islamic culture, both from Al Azhar University, which is the most prestigious university in Islamic Islamic perspective. He is currently the dean of um, a dean of academic affairs and professor at Boston Islamic University. And actually, I have an honor of teaching uh, the course with him uh, in Boston Islamic Seminary on Quran Emergent class. Uh, although I'm nowhere closer to him, but it's an honor for me to even share that forum with him. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Basuni. Dr. Basini, you are. Dr. Asif. It's my honor actually to join you and uh, to uh, to learn and hear from you and from your students. Yeah. And that's your humble Sheikh. Um, and we are looking forward to your comments, inshallah. Uh, now we have Dr. Samira. Uh, Dr. Samira Ali. Uh, again, as I said, they they are my Dr. Samira and Sister Rehab. They are my students. Dr. Samira Ali is geriatrician uh, at Summit Elder Care a program for all inclusive care for, for the elderly, also called PACE. And we are glad that she have joined us, alhamdulillah. Uh, and Sister Rehab Salima, uh, she received uh, her master's in biochemistry. And the research uh, focus um, in uh, is uh, toxicology. So I would like to welcome both of them, Dr. Samira and Sister Rehab. Hope you, are, you both are doing well. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair and Dr. Samira and Sister Rehab. So now I will turn on to Sister Rehab. I will actually give mic and forum to Sister Rehab and Dr. Samira. Now you have next few minutes, inshallah, to present your research paper. And then inshallah, Dr. Basuni Nahela, uh, we're going to give comments. And if we have any questions or if audience have any questions, inshallah, we will ask you, inshallah. So Dr. Samira and Dr. Rehab, please. So, let me try this. Okay, hopefully this is working. So uh, can you see the screen? No, we cannot. Oh, huh. Okay, 
me see. Application window. Share. Hopefully this works. Can you see the screen now? No, we cannot. Yes, we can see now. We can see now. Okay. All right. So, um, so this is a minor thing. So before um, I dig into our research paper, I wanted to acknowledge first and foremost that um, the amount of work has done. So um, because uh, the chunk of this um, literature uh, regarding this issue is in Arabic, and so she did put a lot of effort in this. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And then the second is as to, you know, why why this topic? So I I have a patient who actually is a Muslim as well too. And she she is currently in a vegetative state and something that we'll talk about during this research paper. And I had kind of always wondered as to, you know, if like what is happening on with her is the right thing to do or not, because she does have a tube to help her feed, a tube to help her breathe. And the family had always maintained that um, as long as there's breath that is coming in and out, they wanna continue with the current treatment. So I was just kind of curious as to what Islam has to say about this. So with that, so we'll start. Um, so we already talked about the positive literature in English language regarding the Islamic perspective of end of life care and life sustaining measures and terminal illness. So the um, so decisions made by um, scholars, um, uh, Islamic legislative assemblies in consultation with medical professionals are used for treating diseases and employing life-sustaining measures in terminally ill patients. The scholar of these Islamic legislative assemblies have like amassed proofs from the Quran and Sunnah and have used analogical reasoning to formulate rulings on issues related to medicine. So we all know that Islam emphasizes the sanctity of life and the uh, rulings and medical ethics in Islam is based upon three legal maxims. One is harm to be removed at every cost, if possible. Necessity overrides prohibition, example of which is permissibility of eating haram in order to avoid or prevent death, and accept the lesser of the two harms if both cannot be avoided. So I will hand this off to Sister Rehab. Assalamu everyone. First, we need to know what is death. This simply is the opposite of life. Scholars agreed that this occurs once the spirit departs the body. There is disagreement regarding the stages, the amount, and the time in which the spirit leaves the body. Some Shafi scholars say that soul leaves the body in stages with organs, and then loses function one after the other. Al Ghazali, in his book, Ihya Ulum al Din, defines death as a change in status where the soul is no longer in control of the body. And this definition is closer in meaning to brain death. Some Hanbali and Shafi'i scholars say that soul must leave the entire body to declare death and they included cell decay and decomposition. But majority of scholars oppose this definition as it's, as it's possible to preserve the organs and stop it from decaying for thousands of years by mummification even though the person died a long time ago. Also, the Quran is clear about Allah's authority uh, to revive the dead, as in qawlihi ta'ala, inna nahnu nahil mawta, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's proven that it's impossible to revive a person after they had brain death. Scholars divided life into three types. First, continuous life, where one is in good health and will die at the appointed time. Second, stable life, where the mind is sound, but there is a physical injury. For example, uh, when Umar radiallahu anhu was injured after, stabbed, after being stabbed and his death was certain, but he was still able to uh, make decisions. Third, uh, the slaughtered life, which is Hayatul Mahbuh, where the pulse is present, but a person is not aware of self or surrounding. And there is no voluntary movement in this case. In this case, uh, this case has special rules. We will talk, inshallah, about it in, uh, in the forum. So, 
So we talked about life. So Islamic jurists define life as the combination of input and output. Input is quantified as a patient being aware of his or her self environment and reception of ideas, whereas output is a person's own um, will, uh, which is manifested by purposeful action or communication. If both of these components, that is the input and the output are not present, then the person is not actually considered to be living or a normal human life. So, so this brings us to what is consciousness. So consciousness is a state of being awake and aware of one's self and surroundings. And this is uh, done through like what five senses, which is sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. And um, so the disorders of consciousness, which we are going to further elaborate on, uh, in this state, a person has trouble being awake or being aware or both. So there are three disorders of consciousness. And uh, so this includes coma, vegetative state, and a minimally conscious state. So coma is where a person's eyes remain closed. They are unresponsive to any kind of physical or verbal stimulus. Those who do survive initially, uh, it's they usually uh, it lasts up to four weeks. They're usually dead by then. So it's a very self-limiting state. Uh, the other one is the vegetative state. So this is in which there is lack of any purposeful interaction with the environment. So there is intermittent, intermittent eye opening, sleep, wake cycles. Uh, it's further divided into two. Um, the persistent vegetative state is something that lasts for more than a month, but if kind of lasts for more than three months, then that's like a non-traumatic uh, permanent vegetative state. And if it is, if it's traumatic, then it lasts for more than 12 months. So when somebody is in a coma or in a vegetative state, then it shows there's a little evidence of normal, sustainable human life as they're devoid of input and output, which we talked about in the previous slide. If a patient's coma or vegetative state is deemed irreversible, such as somebody who is in a permanent vegetative state, based on the judgment of three specialty trained physicians, then uh, most jurists consider that it's permissible to withdraw life-sustaining measures at that point. Um, the minimally conscious state is considered normal and sustainable human life. And in this condition is treated like general medical illness when considering withdrawing life sustaining measures. So if someone who is in, uh, in a, a, a minimally con uh, conscious state, then it's, it's not, they're not considered in having a condition with a grim prognosis. However, if there are medical conditions that a patient may have in association with this state, example, when they have like a severe antibiotic resistant infection. So that may lower the patient's potential for overall recovery and make life sustaining measures futile. So again, this must be concluded by three qualified physicians, at which point life sustaining measures may be withdrawn. And in case in which withdrawal of life sustaining measures is permissible, it is not obligated to do so. So the decision to continue or withdraw life-sustaining measures in these cases should be based on the surrogate or proxy's perception of the patient's wishes. It is critical in disorders of consciousness that the physician properly educates the patient's surrogate or proxy on the likelihood of emergence and subsequent prognosis based on available evidence. So what is death in, in medicine? So traditionally speaking, it's the loss of capacity to breathe and the cessation of heart pumping blood. So as medical technology has developed, a gap has started to form between the traditional cardiopulmonary standard and the concept of death. So with the use of artificial means to sustain cardiopulmonary function, the concept of brain death becomes necessary. So modern medicine has established that brain death leading to the cessation of nerve centers is a criteria for human death. So how do you define brain death? So contemporary Muslim scholars have defined brain death as to be a permanent absence of brainstem and brain function. And a question that frequently arises in discussions around medical interventions in the context of Islamic jurisprudence is the validity of brain death as a declaration of death. Uh, per the American Academy of Neurology, brain death is determined by two separate exams for brain physicians, and this includes checking for absence of reversible causes of cognitive depression 
which includes somebody who may have like a very low blood pressure or hypotension, who's um, somebody who has very low body temperature or hypothermia because that can alter uh, the, the way that they may present, uh, having electrolyte abnormalities or intoxicants, absolute lack of responsiveness, including to painful stimuli, absence of brainstem reflexes, absence of respiratory drive, and ancillary testing. So the ancillary testing includes um, checking for electrical activity in the brain, and it's called uh, EEG or an uh, electroencephalogram, and then also cerebral angiography, which is uh, an ultrasound that checks for blood flow in the brain. So these can also be used uh, to confirm uh, brain death and Muslim families can actually request for that as well too. Um, so the Islamic Fiqh Assembly of the Muslim World League had issued a statement uh, which said that it is permissible to turn off the life support systems of a patient whose brain has completely stopped functioning on condition that a committee of three specialized expert doctors decides that the cessation is final and irrecoverable. Such permissibility is valid even if the heart and the respiratory symptoms are, systems are still functioning and mechanically due to life support systems. However, the legal judgment of death is not declared until it is assured that the heart and respirations have fully stopped after turning off all the life support systems. So this declaration does not equate brain death with death, but rather states that death can only be declared upon the cessation of vasomotor and respiratory functions, regardless of whether those are being artificially sustained. The standard brain death exam that physicians perform typically evaluates specifically for brainstem function, which is considered representative of the viability of the rest of the brain. So what exactly is brainstem function? It is, it regulates, the brainstem regulates for heart rate, breathing, sleeping, and eating. So technically what is basically needed to sustain life. The special testing mentioned earlier, which is the EEG, uh, or, you know, to check for uh, brain activity. And we talked about that and also a uh, study to show the brain, uh, the blood flow to the brain. So as I talked about it, that this is, so these studies are to evaluate, it, these could be like, you know, to provide more information on the condition of the whole brain than the brain death exam alone. So again, as talked about earlier that, you know, Muslim families can also request this. So who can report brain death. So this again has to be two specialists who are experienced in the diagnosis of brain death. Recommended Recommendation is to consult a third specialist in case if it's like a neurological disease if needed. And at least one of the doctors should be specialized in neurology, neurosurgery, or intensive care. People who cannot report brain death, um, those who are in the organ, organ transplant team for obvious reasons, any member of the injured family. Secondary again usually is people who have, um, who gain something from the patient's death, like a legacy or a will. Um, and anyone who's accused by the injured person's family of professional misconduct toward the injured person. So what are life-sustaining measures that we talk about? So these can include artificial nutrition and hydration and also um, mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation is usually used when somebody is not able to breathe on their own. It could be like temporary if somebody has like a bad pneumonia and so they can go on it and then recover from it. But then sometimes, but if it comes to a point where they're dependent on it to help breathe, then that's where things kind of get a little bit more complicated. Artificial and nutrition. Artificial nutrition and hydration is it's a means of providing nutritional support when a patient is unable to eat or drink. Uh, this intervention can be temporary or prolonged, depending upon the underlying medical condition. So complications of enteral feeding or uh, tube feeds include risk of infections, electrolyte imbalances, and mechanical blockage. The decision to initiate the treatment depends upon the personal goals of care and whether the benefit of the treatment outweighs the harm from foregoing the intervention. In conditions where the patient is not terminally ill, obtaining nutrition by enteral means is encouraged. Otherwise, the patient would starve, which is not permissible in Islam. 
Muslim jurists view antral feeding as a form of medical treatment if it helps towards extending life and preserving bodily strength. In conditions where there is no hope for meaningful recovery, as determined by a physician, the potential harm from such interventions may outweigh the potential benefits and may thus prolong suffering. Euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide is not allowed in Islam. Now I want to describe scholars' opinion about withdrawing life-sustaining measures from patients with brain death. Many Maliki, Hanbali, and a few Shafi'i scholars equate brain death to actual death and apply all death rulings such as calculating idda and dividing inheritance. They believe that when the brain stem, heart, and lungs stop functioning, the person is considered dead, regardless of the artificial means by which their heart and lung functions are sustained. On the other hand, some scholars don't consider brain death as actual death. They don't regard a person as dead unless there is this at the cellular level, like cell decay and cell decomposition. But most of them agree to pull the block of the life-sustaining measures when, the patient, uh, when patients are terminally ill and there is no meaningful recovery, and they believe that it's not obligatory to seek treatment in this condition. Some Shafi'i and Hanbali scholars adopt this opinion, although some scholars are against the removal of ventilator support from someone with brain death, mostly Shafi'i scholars who hold this opinion. And some Hanbali scholars give a person with brain death the rules of the slaughtered life. In this case, life-sustaining measures can be removed and organs can be used for donation, even though the heart hasn't stopped beating. But the rules of inheritance and calculation of idda will be applied after the heart, uh, the heart completely stops beating. Um, Let's have a, a deep look to the scholar's evidences. Uh, so first I will talk about the supporting evidences. Uh, these scholars believe that a person's life ends when the body loses the ability to interact and communicate with the soul, as is the case in a person who is declared brain dead. Also, a living being is uh, one whose body is able to sustain organ function without the help of artificial means. In this case, removing the life-sustaining measures from a patient with brain death is not equivalent to terminating life. Um, based on the physician's decision that there is no hope of meaningful recovery in a patient with damage to, uh, to the brain stem, then seeking treatment is disliked. Treatment is recommended if there is a chance of meaningful recovery. Also, spinal reflex is not conscious response. It's an invo uh, it's an in un uh, it's an in um, uh, an involuntary stereotyped pattern of response brought by a sensory stimulus. Finally, using life sustaining measures as a means to prolonging life, which is useless, is contradicting the Sunnah of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who has advised against delaying the funeral. فقد روى الإمام أحمد في مسنده عن علي رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ثلاثة يا علي لا لا تؤخرهن الصلاة إذا أتت والجنازة إذا حضرت والأيم إذا إذا وجدت كفأ صدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم This hadith means that رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أدفس علي رضي الله عنه to not delay three things uh, first the prayer when it's time come Second, funeral if it comes. Third, marrying an unmarried woman or girl if she found a complement. Uh, next slide, please. Now I want to discuss the evidences prohibiting withdrawal of life-sustaining measures from patients with brain death. Um, based on the legal maxim, certain, certainty is not overruled by doubt. al yaqinu la yuzalu bishak. These scholars claim that certainty of patients with brain death condition is to be alive because, because they are uh, breathing and their heart still uh, beating. 
Opponents of this idea claim that uh, after physician de uh, physicians determine stopping of brain and brain stem function, uh, brain death is not a doubt, but a strong probability. Also, scholars claim that a person who is brain dead is similar to the case of the people of the cave, Ashab al-Kahf. Uh, since Ashab al-Kahf were unaware of their surrounding, but stayed alive for more than 309 years. But there is no comparison between the two situations because the people of the cave slept normally, who prior to this event didn't appear to be in a state of illness. Also, this was a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who awakened them after a prolonged slumber. Also, a patient who is brain dead has permanently lost awareness of the self and surrounding due to underlying brain injury. Unlike the people of the cave, who lost their sense of surrounding because we uh, were in a state of deep slumber. And when they woke up, they had regained full consciousness. Uh, in the same way, both based on the fact that preservation of life is one of the objective of Sharia in Islam and is classified as necessity, scholars prohibited pulling the life-sustaining measures from patients with brain death those who against this opinion assert that protecting life as a necessity means that protecting uh, uh, means that protection of the ones who are actually living and doesn't include the ones who are not and a patient who is brain dead is already dead so this evidence doesn't satisfy this objective finally these scholars consider withdrawal or ventilator support is a type of mercy killing however Patient who is brain dead are unaware of self and surrounding and they lack the sense of pain. To sum it up, uh, to sum it up as well as we see now how the life sustaining measures are crucial during the pandemic, especially ventilators to save lives. While in such cases as brain death, it can be used unnecessarily prolonging life where there is no hope for meaningful recovery and divert resources away from those who need uh, who need it the most. Uh, that's it, Sister Dr. Sumira and Sister Ya. Oh, yeah. Jazak, Jazakumullahu Khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward both of you. It's an amazing, amazing work and amazing, amazing presentation, mashallah. I was really feeling happy uh, and proud, if I can, uh, that mashallah, both of you, uh, I have an honor of teaching both of you, alhamdulillah, but for the last two semesters, what and what you have accomplished, mashallah. Now, without uh, any further delay and without, um, actually, before I can ask you a few questions, I already have a few questions, inshallah. I would uh, love to hear comments of Dr. Basuni Nahila, inshallah. Yes, Dr. Basuni. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wa salamu ala shaykhun wa rahim Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tayyibina wa tayyibina wa ba'd. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you uh, for this uh, beautiful uh, and great job. Uh, we start with uh, the uh, the teacher and the supervisor, uh, Dr. Asif. MashaAllah, uh, Allah here for leading this project and also for guiding <coughs> our brothers and the sisters in the Muslim community to have those kind of projects to serve the, the Muslim community and for our Islamic knowledge uh, to be relevant and to find some people who can understand and implement in our current life. This is really one of the main missions that we, we carry as uh, the seekers of knowledge uh, in this uh, society. Uh, and Jazakum Allah here for taking this initiative and encouraging our brother and sisters to uh, fulfill this mission that we believe in. It. The uh, second about our uh, sisters, mashallah, uh, great job. Uh, I, I, I see, mashallah, an academic uh, Islamic uh, paper that uh, all of us should be proud of, and this uh, product of uh, this uh, uh, of this title and this uh, uh, knowledge uh, should be something that uh, the Muslim community should celebrate, <clears throat> and we need to encourage one another also to take it to the next level. Uh, the, the, the seeker of knowledge always are 
uh, appreciated <coughs> and recognized uh, first by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for all of us, we have really uh, to recognize your effort, uh, your intention, and your uh, your product. Uh, this is something Allah subhanahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one to reward you for it. And uh, I think my role <coughs> uh, and is to uh, just have an open discussion about your project and try, inshallah, to advance it and to take it to the next level. Because our ultimate goal is to have something that can serve the Muslim community and that can present also our, <coughs> our, our, our institutions, the, uh, our Islamic center in... Uh, Worcester, uh, the Islamic, uh, the, the Boston Islamic Seminary. Uh, we we need really to have something that we 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 can present it to Muslim and non-Muslim as well. Uh, so about the topic, I think the topic is uh, is needed, and uh, we need some people who are specialized in this field, like Sister Samira and Sister Rehab, to tackle it. Uh, of course, with the, the religious supervision and some people who are uh, knowledgeable about Islam, about the fiqh issues, so we can take the Islamic knowledge <coughs> to serve our need in this in this society. <coughs> Just because we, we would like really to have it an academic paper and also for this discussion to be an academic discussion, I would like to highlight some uh, uh, some some points. For a paper like this, when we read the title. <coughs> I, I expected that uh, I will find some definitions for this title in your introduction. Uh, you start in your introduction, just I, I, I found that you were talking about death in, in, from the Islamic perspective or from <clears throat> the medical perspective, uh, perspective, which is okay. And we need to, to talk about this. But uh, for someone like, uh, like me, uh, I would like to understand what do you mean by this title? Each word that you use in this title should be explained and defined in your introduction clearly. So all of us, the uh, the, uh, the the authors, the supervisors, the uh, the uh, the uh, the readers of this paper, uh, will be uh, in the same page. This is exactly what you mean. I mean by, for example, <coughs> saying al fiqh al islami What does it mean fiqh Islam? Uh, you mean Shafi'i fiqh? or you mean uh, comparative fiqh, or you mean the uh, contemporary fiqh, the fiqh Islami that's being used in our current life. You need really to define what you mean by this, by each word that you use in your title. This is really something important. The other thing also about the, um, the your ab uh, abstract that you started with, that uh, looks like you had some idea in your mind. At the beginning of your of your paper, and for me, you have to be you have to be free from the beginning, and you have to be free from any pressure or any personal ideas and the concept that you have. You are trying to get a conclusion, and this paper will take you to this conclusion. So do not send this feeling that the the writer or the authors or the students they have some ideas and they try to prove. And the, the paper here will be a way to prove your idea. I felt this from the beginning. But let me feel that you are trying to reach a conclusion, a fair conclusion, to serve the title and to serve your purpose, not to serve an idea that you have in your mind. Okay? But, but this is something in your abstract you need to clarify. The other thing is about the... Uh, uh, in, 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 in your paper, I was expecting actually to tell me <clears throat> what is the reason behind uh, writing about this topic. Sister Samir, at the beginning, you mentioned uh, uh, your reason. But in your paper, you need really to clarify one or two or three reasons. I have chosen this topic, or the group actually has chosen this topic for those reasons. Maybe some real cases uh, you have faced as a physician, uh, some people asked you to do this. Uh, there is a need among the Muslim community. Our Muslim chaplains, you, you need to have <clears throat> some contribution to serve the Muslim community in general. This is one. And uh, so the reason behind 
choosing this topic, why you have chosen this topic to be uh, uh, to be your project or final project uh, in, in, in this course. Uh, second, <clears throat> uh, the, the previous contribution, you are not establishing or uh, starting something from scratch, by the way. Uh, so what is, uh, or you have to list at least the main uh, scholarly contribution to this topic. Uh, and that will show me that, yes, you did your job. You, you have researched and you will be building on a previous contribution, a scholarly contribution. Uh, I'm not talking about the Shafi'i and the Malik. I'm talking about the, the current <clears throat> academic papers that might tackle this topic before you. And you need to refer to this from the beginning that uh, uh, this scholar uh, spoke about it. But what is your addition? to the current contribution, okay? Are you repeating the same thing? Are you are you aiming to add something in you to this uh, paper? Uh, this is, should be clear from the beginning, by the way, that yes, uh, we have found those articles talking about this topic, this uh, academic contribution, we found them and we went through all of them for the main papers. And we found that they were lacking something and our goal to cover it. Our goal, our goal to find something that can cover uh, what uh, people before us didn't find or didn't uh, uh, come up with. Uh, uh, this is what will put you in, you know, are talking about academic paper, okay? But, but that means that you have to take it to this approach. The other thing which is really important, and uh, I, I, I would like to, uh, yeah, and both of you to pay attention to and to add, what is your methodology in your paper? I, I don't know. I, I was evaluating the paper, but uh, I was really uh, uh, looking for a specific methodology to use uh, in my evaluation. And so should I use my own methodology to evaluate you or I have to use your own methodology? And this is, by the way, that you have to put it at the, at the beginning. So when we uh, evaluate your paper when you help you to advance your paper we say okay now you are following your own ways and means of research <clears throat> and the methodology very clear you bought it at the beginning you are following it through the uh, your paper and through your research and now you are getting this uh, conclusion and this result at the end uh, the, for me the, the methodology was not clear and uh, if it's clear in your mind, you have also to put it at the beginning, so the, uh, at the beginning of your research, so that the reader or the examiner can be aware of your methodology. And that also will put you in a good shape that this is, this is what I believe in, this is what I am following, this is my path, and I will follow this. Uh, the, the, the other thing is <clears throat> this, this, those crucial issues uh, uh, are really uh, are really very crucial yeah, that we have to say that those kinds of topics are very crucial and important. And, and I think it, it might be better not just to collect different opinions, but if you can focus on what is the best way to reach a conclusion and to, 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 to consider this as your, your, your contribution to this topic, because it's a big topic. And you are not giving a fatwa, by the way, unless from the beginning you show me and you tell me that you are trying to give a fatwa. But right now we are, we are not trying to give a fatwa because we have many fatwas on this. But I think your contribution would be that you are trying to find a new way to tackle this subject or a new way to, to serve and to help our imams and scholars to make a better fatwa. Okay, As, yeah, both of you, mashallah, you are experts in this field and you have experience in dealing with the patients here and there and also to interact with families whom they went through this difficult time. You might highlight those experience and you take some ideas that can help our scholars, our ulama, our mashayikh, our imams to make the right decision and to help you as a physician to make the right decision and to help the families as well to take the right direction. 
and that should be also something to focus on but just to uh to uh collect the previous opinions shafia and maliki and other and the the different opinions those are are very very clear we know this we know what what is your contribution to this topic okay but uh, this is one and the last thing that i will share that is about your reference mashallah long big list of references but uh, uh, is your target audience uh, arab people or english speakers and you have to to tell if they are the, the arabic people if, uh, the, you, the entire the entire paper should be in arabic and if it is for the english speakers why you are mentioning your references in arabic you have to write in, in English. I think now you have 10, 10, 10 paper or 10 pages in, the, in, the, in your research. And if just you get out of those paper, the, the, the Arabic references, you find about maybe two, three pages in Arabic. Uh, but we need you, we need your help, we need your support, new contributor really to address those issues in English and also to, uh, to deliver our message to our uh, Muslim physicians and for physicians in general whom they are dealing with this kind of issues <clears throat> and tell them for example if someone approach uh, uh, dr asif in his majid with the same question he should refer i uh, refer to this paper we have a paper here and if they look at it and they find that it is in arabic some of uh, some of it is in arabic and english and you are uh, using sometimes Arabic uh, statements, uh, Arabic names, uh, without reference, uh, you need to take it to this level. Something that we can use. I, for example, if someone asked me, I, I would say, okay, I remember that uh, one month ago th th there was a good paper and this paper can be a good reference. People can use your effort should be utilized to serve the Muslim community. And you have to look at this level. I am putting the effort and putting the time. I have, you have someone like Sheikh uh, Imam Asif can, can help you really take it to this, to this level so we can use it, we can utilize it. Uh, not just in your Islamic center, but in all Islamic uh, centers and in, in America in general. If we do this, we now we are practicing uh, the real way of seeking the knowledge. The real way of seeking the knowledge, not to contain the knowledge in your mind, but the real way in seeking the knowledge in an Islam to practice an Islam, to deliver the message of an Islam, to take an Islam as a way to produce something through it. Something from an Islam can be uh, produced and can be introduced as well to people, Muslim and non-Muslim. And uh, but, but uh, uh, overall, this paper really is, is a great project, mashallah. I learned a lot of uh, things from it, and I think uh, both of you, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, the, the guidance and the instructions of uh, Dr. Asif, you can take it to the next level, uh, and so we, we can, inshallah, utilize it in our Muslim community, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair for great, your great effort. As I mentioned, we are trying to play different roles, so we can take this paper to the, uh, to the next level, inshallah. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan, Shaykhana, Dr. Basuni Nahila. It was extremely, extremely great comments, mashallah. Um, and I'm pretty sure that um, not only myself, but even uh, Dr. Samira and Sister Rehab must have taken notes, the observation, the mulahazat, so that inshallah we can improve our paper. Because uh, Dr. Basuni, our plan is to publish this paper, inshallah. Uh, and this this uh, observation and these comments will really help inshallah to fine tune before we can go towards the publication. And actually just want to tell you what you mentioned, Dr. Vasuni. Uh, the reason, because I submitted paper actually three, four months ago, but it came in my mind to actually go through this process because I had to, was actually last month, I got a call from Pennsylvania from one of the masjid that they had the same question. And I said, wait, I have a research paper on my inbox and I actually forwarded them and they loved it, mashallah. I didn't tell this to Dr. Samira and Sister Rehab. Um, and then actually it gave me the idea that I should um, uh, publish this on our website and then eventually publish it. And then we should go through it with the uh, defense uh, process, inshallah. So uh, yes, Dr. Basir. 
But mashallah, jazakumullah khair. This is really great. Yeah, this reason should be mentioned at the beginning of this paper. Let people know that there is a need in our Muslim community, and the even non-Muslim community still they, they are looking for this kind of knowledge and the directions from trustworthy institutions and people in the society like you. Jazakumullah khair. Oh yeah, uh, just uh, a few few questions and comments, uh, Sister Rehab and Dr. Samira from my side. Uh, first of all, um, uh, as Dr. Basuni said, I, I don't have any status or deserving of saying something when Dr. Basuni said so many things, mashallah. But just to uh, ask you a few things um, uh, so that inshallah it will be clear to me and clear to whoever is listening to this right now. So Dr. Samira, uh, because let's let me start with you. At the time of COVID, uh, when organs are not working properly, patient is um, in the life support ventilator. Should we continue with the life support with the hope that this virus will go away from the body? Or should we remove, if you are following that one of the opinion that is disliked and makru, what did you what did we learn from this research from a from a relevant standpoint? And being a doctor, what you will say, if that, let's say if that patient is on the ventilator for some time now. As a family member, what will be your advice as a medical doctor and a person who have a paper on this? That's a very good question. So it really comes down to um, different variables. So as a physician, I can tell you that when this whole COVID process started, we were told as um, general for all the physicians from all the governing bodies, medical governing bodies to talk to our to talk to our patients, talk to their families about end of life care. So we had to go through their advanced directives. And um, and then there were patients who were initially like, you know, full code, which basically is do everything. We then had to talk through talk through this and this to like, you know, given your medical issues, your pre-existing medical conditions, and if you were to get infected, what are your chances of um, of recovery? So, and one of the things that this pandemic has taught us is that resources are not unlimited. So unfortunately in certain circumstances, you know, my colleagues had to make that decision as to if this is something that will even, you know, putting them on mechanical ventilation is, is really even the best that is for that patient or not. And um, so then you are kind of like, you know, left with, okay, there are these patients who need mechanical support, like, you know, ventilation, but here we have somebody who's younger, may not have that many medical issues, and they have a better chance of recovering from it. And also understanding that people who are infected with COVID, when they do go on mechanical support, they're usually very, very sick. And it takes more than the usual time that people are on ventilation for, for example, like a bad pneumonia. So you, here you have people, you know, who are instead of being on the ventilator for a week or two, they may take like three weeks or more. So that's very unusual. So if somebody who is on the older side or who's older and has uh, multiple medical issues, so their chances of recovering from this are not going to be that great to begin with. So, and then, you know, we're talking about meaningful recovery. So if there is, if your organs are all failing, because it's not just with the COVID infection, it's not just only that you're not able to breathe, your whole entire system is kind of actually thrown out of um, you know, it's, it's gone awry. So your your heart is affected, your kidneys are affected. So if all of the organ systems are not really working and it's failing, and then you know that they're not going to be recovering from it, then trying to then, you know, keep them on um, life-sustaining measures is not going to be helpful because there is no going, there's no purposeful or meaningful recovery after that. Beautiful, beautiful response, mashallah, uh, Dr. Samira. Uh, for Sister Rehab, um, you, you spoke um, uh, about fiqh and uh, fiqhi references, about Hamli and Shafis are saying this, and few Shafis are saying this, and Malikis are saying this. Um, I just have uh, one question, and that is um, when you say that so and so must have said this, Shafi must have said this, Hamli must have said this. It is, is it one scholar within the Shafi Mazhab or it is the authorized position, Muftabihi position in that Mazhab? Because we have to be extremely clear as a Fiqh student. Because in your footnotes, I see a lot of contemporary names when you are saying Shafi Mazhab. Uh, and I know this is a contemporary issue. Yes, the contemporary uh, but, and yeah, most you know, 
Uh, I know this is Fakhrul Nawazil, but you know, please go ahead. Is this an authorized position of the Mazhab, or is it just a, one contemporary scholar saying this? And there are multiple positions, like we study in fifth class. Uh, actually, uh, about the definition, the like definition of this and all of that, this was uh, the authorized position of the Madhab. But uh, about the issue and the different opinions, it's uh, they were contemporary scholars uh, that um, following these Madhab. So, as it's shown in the paper. Um, uh, inside the Shafi'i Madhab, there are many scholars. They each one of the, each one of them has a different opinion. All the three opinions are just the Shafi'i scholars adopted one of them. So it's um, it's very diverse, and all of them are contemporary uh, scholars, not the uh, authorized position of the Madhab. Okay, that's that's good. Last question for you, and then one question for Dr. Basuni, and we will end, inshallah. So, Dr. Basuni, before you, I will come to you, I will come to Sister Rehab, and I'll come to you, and we'll conclude, inshallah. So, Sister Rehab, one more question for you um, is that um, just to summarize that fiqhi discussion, because you, mashallah, showed PowerPoint, you showed uh, entire thing. Um, who are those scholars who say that if a person is brain dead? and there is no chance of recovery, then it's makru to keep on the ventilator. And again, who said we should not remove the life support from the brain dead because they are like the Ashab al-Kahf. And what is the hukum on that? Is it haram? What can you just summarize briefly? Okay. I'll give you the, uh, you would like, uh, you want the names of the... Um... Yeah, I guess you said Maliki, Hamli, and some Shafi says it's uh, it's, 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 it's makru in, in those circumstances when the patient is brain dead and there is no hope for recovery to give him that pain. Uh, is that what I got? Um, here, uh, when I said that, uh, that many Maliki and Hanbali and Shafi'i scholars, um, the name of the, uh, they, who said that, um, they who equate the brain death with equal death, yeah. uh, some of their names was Muhammad, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Naim Yasin. Sorry for, because most of them, no some reason. of them doctors and some of them, I'm not, uh, I will, I don't know ex exactly their titles. I'll just Absolutely. Say Sorry for them. Uh, Sheikh Ahmad uh, Sharafuddin and Muhammad Mukhtar Al Sulami, um, Sheikh Omar Sulaiman Al, um, Al Ashqar and Maher Hathout. Uh, all of this and also uh, the Islamic Fiqh Academy of the Organization of the Islamic Conference. Uh, they equate the brain death with, uh, uh, with the actual death and give them the same ruling. Um, about the scholars who consider the, who, who, who doesn't um, equate this brain death with actual death, they have two different opinions. They, um, some of them agreed that uh, we should uh, remove the ventilators from them because uh, it's it's not um, I don't know it's it's like prolonging the 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 period before death like prolonging the ihtidar they are in the stage of ihtidar and they need uh, it's not encouraged to inc uh, to increase uh, this uh, this period so that's why the some of uh, the scholars uh, said it's. And uh, that it's the uh, it's not useful to use this um, uh, this uh, life sustaining measures, and I uh, I illustrated the evidence for them. Yeah. Uh, the good. names were um, Dr. Abdul Fattah Idris is a Shafi'i scholar. Also, Dr. Tawfiq Al Wa'i is a Shafi'i scholar. Also, Jad Al Haq Ali Jad Al Haq Sheikh Jad. Um, who else? about the, um, the group of scholars who give the brain death uh, patients the rule of selected life, mostly they were, it was a Hanbali, um, okay. Hanbali uh, 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 mazhab uh, scholar, Dr. Muhammad Sulaiman Al-Ashqar. I believe uh, this was his opinion. And, who, and uh, this opinion also it's, uh, has been um, adopted by uh, the Islamic Organization of Medical Science in Kuwait. Um, that's it, I'm not sure. That's it, no, Jazakallah Khairan. May Allah reward you immensely, Sister Rehab and Dr. Samira for this beautiful, beautiful paper. And uh, may Allah SWT give you both beneficial knowledge, inshallah. Uh, before mm -hmm. I can conclude, inshallah, Dr. Basuni, uh, this question came in my fifth class a lot. 
And who is a better person than you to answer this question and teach me and um, our students also, inshallah. Um, when, a, when a person starts his journey, especially in a country like America for fiqh, understanding as a fiqh student, uh, then sometime as a, as a uh, layman person, not as a jurist, as a layman person, Cheki, he got confused that, okay, there are so many opinions. Why is that so? Um, and uh, many a times we try to answer them, them that اختلافهم رحمت الله و جماعهم حجت قاطعة that this is, this is a vast mercy for, for the communities and for the individual. Uh, but for a layman, uh, how, how, how can you explain this? Is this a confusion or is this a source of this disagreement in fiqh is actually a source of mercy so that we can be flexible and we can take whatever is good for a community and remove the hardship? What's your take uh, in it, Cheki? Uh, of course, this is a big topic. You cannot just uh, discuss it in one or two minutes. Uh, but I, I, I would like to emphasize here the importance of, uh, of having our own fiqh here for the Muslim community in America in general. Uh, still now we are trying just to bring the old opinions or the, uh, the other opinions from different countries, from different backgrounds to be used here in this society. <clears throat> I think the responsibility of our ulama here and our uh, scholars and imams in America is very heavy and they have to understand that their role not just to deliver the knowledge that they have in mind, but really to make new fiqh that can fit our uh, circumstances here in this society. For our Muslim scholars whom they live in this society, they are aware of all challenges, opportunities, difficulties that we are facing in this society and their role actually to come together with an opinion, a fiqh opinion that can serve our Muslim community. If we do this, we can see the mercy, the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we insist just to, <clears throat> to import some of uh, different opinions and different fiqh from different countries to be used in this society, now we are not showing the people the rahmah of our fiqh and the flexibility of our religion. The flexibility and the rahmah of our fiqh is when we reach this level of producing new fiqh that can be used here in this society. And this is the real meaning of fiqh. Fiqh means what? Understanding. Understanding your religion, understanding the main sources of our religion very well, and also understanding the historical fiqh yeah. and the fiqh that we see from our uh, well-respected jurists our imams, and then understanding the surroundings, the, the place in which we live, and being able to come up with new fiqh that can serve people here in this society. Mm -hmm. I don't like anyone to say, okay, uh, we have some issues here, let us send this uh, question to someone in this specific country or place to make a fatwa for us, to make an opinion for us. That is not, that's not acceptable based on my understanding. Uh, and it, it is a very heavy responsibility. We have to come up with this uh, project, inshallah. And this, by the way, one of our main projects at the Boston Islamic Seminary, and you are part of our organizations. Our honor to have you, uh, Dr. Asif, with uh, this uh, sound understanding that you have and you practice among the Muslim community. And we, we would like really to gather all those efforts so we can come up with this big project to serve the Muslim community and to plant the seed of having our own fiqh, the fiqh that can serve the Muslim community now and in the coming 20 years. And once we have this concept, people will inherit it, people will come up, inshallah, with more ideas. And uh, so we will get the reward of at least the, uh, the people who initiate uh, those good deeds among Muslim community and among humanity. Jazakumullah khair for this opportunity. I'm very glad really to, uh, to be with you and to learn from all of you, Sister Samira, Sister Rehab. MashaAllah, you did a wonderful job. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and reward you for this. Uh, Dr. Asif, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, bless your effort. And uh, we ask Allah to gather all of us, inshallah, in uh, al Jannah, in a better place. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Peace, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, uh, Shaykhi Basiuni Nahila. Jazakumullah khairan, Dr. Samira and Sister Rehab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you. اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصلوا بالحق وتواصلوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين جزاكم الله خيرا to all the people who have joined us online I'll see you next week إن شاء الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير